Okay, this film took five years of my life to, to get to this stage. And of course, if I had known what, where we would be today, five years ago, I probably would have made a stronger statement at the end about standing up and resisting and so on. But how many people in here have gone to marches or have demonstrated and since, you know, who has been arrested? <laughs> I mean, elected. <laughs> Ooh, premonition. Um, wishful thinking. Well, anyway, I thank you very much for coming. And I really, I really want you to to get to meet and to have uh, Professor Kashima come up because if you have questions, we'll have a Q and A afterwards. But I think he is he has something important to say. So please. Well, you people are really privileged. This kind of film is so important that I'm sure most of you don't know about Loop and Moab, Cow Creek Camp. How many of you have know about them besides just hearing about the words? Anyone know a lot about them? Two, three? Yeah, some of you have been studying that because that's where relatives of yours were in, right? But for others of us, we didn't know about this. And when I started teaching my Asian American Studies class way back in 1976, I just retired from the University of Washington after 39 years of service. Hey! <laughs> It's a great university, so send your kids to the University of Washington. <laughs> but they, have, they need a 3.7 GPA to get in. <laughs> but anyway, it's a, it, it's a, it, they, for 39 years, allowed me to teach a class like this. But when I first started, there was no apology. There was no civil rights movement. Well, it's just a, the, the, the nascent part of it, but the start of it. There was no Presidential Medal of Freedom. There was no... 20 medals of honor, the highest military uh, honor we can give to soldiers in, in, in our military uh, history. We, we didn't have all these kind of things. We didn't have people like, uh, no, no, we didn't know about people like Gordon Hirabayashi, or Min Yasui, or Fred Korematsu. We did know, we did know about people like uh, Wayne Collins, uh, the father of, of uh, Wing Kong's junior because of, of Abe versus the uh, U.S., especially if you were in law, you saw these cases. But, you know, the rest of us, we didn't say very much, nor do we talk about it. And that's why in here I called it social amnesia. Social amnesia is not a sense in which you are trying to repress something. It's more suppression because when you raise them up into the consciousness, then it can really affect you because there's no way that one had, at the very very end of the war, any way of resolving that. Because you know you were innocent, but just because of your face, you were seen to be the enemy. That's really a difficult thing to be an American because the due process was not given to us. We weren't judged, we weren't tried, we weren't sentenced. And I was a one-year-old going into Topaz with my folks. Going back to Topaz, going back to Minidoka, going back to Manzanar, going back to some of these camps, Heart Mountain, when I step on that reservation land now, it's like, this is sacred ground. And I hope all of you would have the opportunity to go on a pilgrimage and to just, just walk around. You, you, you get the feeling of, of 8,000 people running around for three years of their lives. And I, as, as I said in, 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 in the film, for me as a child, it was a great time. I tell people, for me, the, it, you know, the, the, my memories of camp life was sitting in the lap of Mr. Katayama watching the Friday night movies. And Mrs. Katayama would be next to us feeding me candy. <laughs> it was great. But the Issei's did that for the young kids so that we would, we would not feel the hurt and the pain and the loss of their livelihood, their property, their jobs. The, they had no future every single day. They were just facing bar bar prison, and then they're facing special cases like Manzanar. Just when they're 
protesting a wrong that was occurred to them, the WA made them the enemy by calling it a riot. And everyone in Manzanar knew that. And it's so Kafka-esque. That is, it, it, it's a situation which you can't understand why it happened, except that it did happen, and there's no recourse. And by the way, when we started investigating, it wasn't that the government was trying to really hide these things. Under the Freedom of Information Act, I was able to, <laughs> with a lot of time and effort, get materials about each of these it, cases. And so that's why all of us, Greg Robinson and and um, Eric Mueller, um, Roger Daniels, uh, all, uh, all, uh, Rosalind Tone and I, 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 these folks and us, we were able to write about it so that you get this very important documentary because it's an area in which we didn't know about and now you all know about Moab, Loop, and Cow Creek Camp. And I'm going to end this because I think it's your questions that are going to be most important so that you can ask Claudia or myself about them and we'll just try to answer them. But the main thing I want to say is there's an area here, and I'm sorry, areas that we still don't know about. <laughs> and I want us to keep looking at this, but for all of you too, you know, read books, see her next documentary, which is going to be a powerhouse, and hopefully she'll talk about that. And join us on pilgrimages. One really important thing that I, I see is that with the passing of the Issei generation, because they've all pretty much gone, the Nisei generation, many of them stood up in the camp and after. But to me, it's the Sansei and the Yonsei for which we have a hope for the future. The Sanseis, really back in the 1970s, pushed us, little older folks, to start working for some kind of way of getting redress. And part of that was to start an ethnic studies department and program and to have us investigate this and offer these kinds of classes. But now the Sansei and Yonseis are involved with more things. They've gone beyond just Japanese Americans. And so they're working with issues dealing with civil rights for all groups. Fantastic. They're also involved with the, 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 the issue of which individuals as individuals are being discriminated upon and they're making changes, and so they get involved with LGBTQ parades. We have to join them. You also have to be the people, Japanese American ancestry and others, but also especially Japanese ancestry folks, to protest that it doesn't happen to any other group like Muslims. Because we can say we were forced to be put into these kind of camps and we have the right to say, don't ever do that to any other group without reason. It's okay if someone commits a crime and they're judged and they're found guilty. I mean, you can still have miscarriage of judges, miscarriage of justice, but that's okay. You know, if they're, if they're charged, given a trial, fair trial with a jury, you know, okay, and they're fine, guilty, guilty, not guilty. That's the way our constitution works. But to be put away as a one-year-old child into a camp because of a military necessity, boy, that's really something. And that's what the uh, Issei's and Nisei's went through. So please, all of you, get involved. It's not only your right, but I think it's our, it's our duty so that it doesn't happen to other groups. That's the only way we're gonna survive as Americans. And we have many, many friends who aren't JAs, many friends, but we almost band together and help each other out. It's the only way we're going to become humane. And how many, it's, it's the only way we're going to remain humane individuals. So I'm, I'm going to just shut up so that you, know, you can ask your questions. Claudia? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Stay, stay here. Stay here. Answer some questions. Thank you so very much. He's my mentor. He's, you know, he's been, he's my rock through this, through this project. So as you can see why. Small uh, pebble. <laughs> Small pebble. Um, do you have any questions for any of you? Um, it's hard to see in this light, but do you have any questions? 
I'll be bringing a mic around to those yeah. who do have questions so we can all hear it. If you can go ahead and just raise your hand, I'll come right by you. I can't see anything. But um, in the meantime, while we're looking for the questions, that's, oh, um, oh, we found one? Great. So in the, in the camp where um, the Japanese Americans are being held, will you compare that to Guantanamo? In the citizen isolation centers and in Tule Lake, they were, they were, especially in, in the, when <clears throat> Moab, they were treated, if you didn't, they were, they outnumbered guards were four to one. For every prisoner, they had four guards. They could go nowhere without a guard. You went to the bathroom, you had to have a guard. You couldn't speak uh, Japanese, and most, since most of these were Kibe, why were they Kibe? Because they had gone to Japan and therefore were more suspect. Um, but also the other, on the other side, the Kibe were the ones who spoke Japanese and could join the military intelligence service. You know, it's just like, um, it, it is very arbitrary sometimes, and some of these people were taken to the citizen isolation centers, as you can see, mistaken identities, but they didn't correct that. Once, you know, some men were brought there because their names were close to another man who, um, and, but they were not allowed to leave, even though it wasn't, they weren't supposed to be there. Um, but in terms of Guantanamo, it's, um, uh, they were very harshly treated in these camps. And then when, when they were discovered, they were then ruled to be illegal and they sent to Tule Lake, that's when they were beaten up, you know, especially the ones who resisted, who, who said, this is, this is wrong. You know, when they got mad enough to say, we're going to renounce our citizenship. And you, know, you sort of can't blame them for becoming pro, you know, going out and marching. But you know, they were, those guys were beaten up with those bats. And, and, uh, and the only reason we have those pictures is because one of the guards, the photographers there, snuck his camera in and just took pictures. That's why they're sort of blurry and out of focus. Otherwise, we wouldn't know that they you know, we just had to take the word of people. But we have photographs to show. Um, the, um, uh, they were maybe not taken into a room and, and they didn't have waterboarding back then. But, you know, they were, they were treated really harsh. They were threatened. Um, you know, if you, already because they were taken away, they were separated from their families. And if you don't do this, then we'll, you know, treat your family badly. Um, what would you say? Do you have any comments on Guantanamo? And there's there's some scholars who are making the case that uh, Guantanamo treatment may be a precursor. I'm sorry, a postcursor <laughs> to what happened during World War II. But uh, so far, it's um, it's it's conjecture, and uh, so it. Um, Certainly, uh, to me, what Eric Mueller at the end said, uh, when you have a situation in which you are uh, afraid of people, then you can do things out of that fear that you would not do normally if you were in a safe environment. In Guantanamo, people are identified as enemies, and so they did things. And what's interesting is the people who are not directly involved, except at the ministry level, are the ones that should be able to say yes or no, halt, or just let it go. And in Guantanamo, it went the other way. Just let it go and let's get them so that we can show how guilty they are. Has anybody done a study to see why there were so much differences various camps on the so-called uh, loyalty, non -loyal. I, I was in Mamachi, and Mamachi is considered loyal because very few people get that study. Has anybody done any study on that to see why the, the disparity, the tremendous disparity between the camps? Well, like I want to make one statement about Mamachi. I, I think it also, to me, I, I learned that some of the camp directors, the directors of the camps were much more tolerant. They're much more humane. Yeah. Our, our camp director, Lindsay, was considered to be the most. The best. Yeah. And of course, if you're being mistreated by, like, if you have a, a Raymond Best as head of your camp, who was, an, you know, as, was this, this authoritarian, well, you're going to get pissed off. You're going to, you know, you want to, you know, it's going to make you, you know, want to resist. I mean, I asked my mother, I said, why did you just go off? 
you know, why didn't you guys resist then? And said, it, you know, because we're products of, you know, uh, this early, later generation. Right, well, maybe, maybe you could speak more to that, but um, I, uh, the Block 42, for example, at, at Tule Lake, were a lot, mostly young, most of those, pic, those guys in that picture were younger guys. And so they, they really were in sense that this was totally against, you know, this is, this is totally unconstitutional. When are we going to be read our rights? You know, when are, we, when are we going to be charged? What are we guilty of? And so they were the ones who said, no, we're not going to even sign the loyalty oath. This is a joke. We're, we're American citizens. Why do we have to say we're loyal American citizens? We're born here, yes, right? Hmm? Yes, in our camp, the word went out. But if you don't want to go in, it's right. Yes, it's drafted. And they object to that. Right. Well, I mean, I can understand. I probably would have signed a no-no because, you know, my father was signed. He said, yes, I'm a loyal American citizen. No, I will not join the Army until you free my family. And if you said, until you, if you qualified your answer, you said yes, no, you were considered a no-no and sent up to, to Tule Lake. So you had no, you know, again, who, who uh, can you discuss, can you talk about why, how, how the various camps were different in terms of no, that? That's a great question. And uh, no one's done a study of that per se, but we talk about just as, Claudia and you are saying, that depends on the camp director and the personality that they had. And each camp director did face individuals who were seen as troublemakers. And so the problem with the WRA was it's a brand new, unknown kind of place in which they were, you know, the, the, everyone in WRA knew that they brought people there in without any kind of charge except for their face. And so it started with the wartime civil control administration, the army, the, what they call, what the, uh, the, what the government called assembly centers, like Camp Harmony. You know, we can have a Camp Harmony in, in Seattle. <laughs> and then they built the permanent, pa permanent incarceration camps that we call WRA. And it, people in the administration could make rules at an ad, ad hoc in an ad hoc way and interpret them in, a, in, a, in, in that way. And that's really what happened in uh, Moab and Loop. And there, the one director was extremely, extremely difficult, Raymond Best. And then when, so the answer is, there's been no study of the personality of the entire camps. There have been studies of individuals and their behavior. Uh, and there are FBI reports about how certain decisions resulted in certain kinds of, of, uh, of, uh, of action and consequences, but nothing in that sense because it was sort of a free-floating period in which for the Justice Department camps, there was at least a long history of, of, uh, of holding people who were aliens, whereas in this case, we're holding aliens and citizens. Who, have, who had done nothing wrong except that we removed them from the Western Defense Command because one general, General John R. DeWitt, said we've got to get them all out of my area. So the answer short is there's been no study. Is that, is that more KIAs came out of, uh, out of uh, Amati and Minidoka, the smallest camps, than compared to the other camps? The irony of that. No. They were all I have a question right over here. No. Just then, I don't know if you remember, but uh, my name is Don Hata, Cal State Dominguez Hills. Sure, hi, Don. Five or six years ago, we uh, were on the same program, and I think the first major conference to discuss the need to throw out the official euphemisms and strive for a more accurate terminology. Claudia, kudos to you because this is a, a good example of a feature length documentary that line by line, word by word, introduces a accurate vocabulary, a nomenclature that's appropriate to what really was done to us. Yes. Now, I've got a 
idea, or rather comment, and then a proposition to offer. Now that I'm retired, like Tetsuden, away from the arcane world of academe, I've had more chance to go on uh, pilgrimages and attend various Day of Remembrance programs. And it's the DOR programs uh, for several years. I note that many of these programs go over the same old ground and don't venture into uncharted territory. And people who attend are therefore a social event more than deep contemplation that considers the outrage and indignity of what happened and why it should never happen again. And people mouth the old platitudes, we don't want this to happen again. And yet, consider this, as Nick K go out and conduct outreach to other groups, when you look at the mainstream of America after 9-11, how often do we hear the Nikkei incarceration during World War II mentioned at all. And if it's not mentioned at all, there's so much ignorance and people are not taught this, what impact are we really making? And so here's my proposition. And I've voiced this for years. But after seeing your powerful, powerful documentary, I think that as others view this, strongest statement I've ever heard yet, with all these academics, not just speaking in um, measured tones, but with some outrage in their voices. I've never heard Tetsu Den speak so strongly, for example, or Eric Mueller. Mm. And the, the evidence they present in your film suggests that my idea that's uh, been on the shelf for years may have some credence now. And here it is. We ought to move forward beyond celebrating the success of redress, which is really a celebration only within the Nikkei community. If we really want to point out to others what was done to us, then we should start moving toward an international war crimes tribunal review of what happened. Why stop at those nine partisan political appointees we call the US Supreme Court? The fact that Korematsu and the other cases still are on the books. Yeah. And by choice, the government does not want to push this case. Let's go beyond the US Supreme Court and go to an international war crimes tribunal. And in every day of remembrance program, encourage the students from K-12 through law school, graduate school, to start at least inv investigating how we go about even getting to an international war crimes tribunal. Is this going to embarrass the United States? Damn right it will. <laughs> it's about time. And then maybe people will take notice. And as, as far as being scared into doing things like Guantanamo. That's fine, yes, I believe that. But there's also, as evidenced by this moron currently in the White House, there are people who are simply opportunists and they'll do anything necessary to further their own political agenda. So there are evil people around too. Between the evil and the scared, let's carry our story to a higher level. So what do both of you, either one of you or both of you think about my idea? We start advocating and get the word out. In order to get this story out and what was really done and why other people should be as afraid and outraged, let's start moving for an international war crimes tribunal. Okay. Don. <laughs> uh, my wife, Kanako, is a member of the Minidoka Pilgrimage Committee. Next year, uh, why don't you come on to the pilgrimage and make that kind of pitch with the proviso that you know you could be as angry as you want. <laughs> it it will be fun. We 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 need we need to get different me, different measures me, um, different messages out. Yeah, yes. and that's why her this to me is, is is great because she is able to get people who that we all know about, you know, uh, Eric's and, Fr and uh, uh, Greg Robinson and, and, and Roger, and, and, and get them to be so articulate. We've had this kind of conversation, but to me, the main thing about this is that we're still talking about areas that we don't know about. And this is Moab, Loop, and um, Cow, Cow Creek. Creek. And then her next pro project is going to go to another area that most of us don't know about either. But still, your point, let's do it. Come talk. 
<laughs> make it, and you know, we, 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 we're going to discuss this, okay? So thank you, Don. If I make the motion, will you second it there at Mini <laughs> Well, <laughs> if you frame it that way, I'll second it. Okay. And then, no, wait, wait, that's the question is, how in the world are we going to do that? <laughs> but that's okay, that's okay, we, we've got to start. Okay, so. Are there, are there any other questions? Right here. Yes. Well, originally I wanted to ask, because I learned so much that I didn't know, and I thought I knew a little bit already, but there was so much more I didn't know. So I wanted to ask about this reference to the ACLU. Did I understand correctly that they were opposed to yes. reversing the renunciation? Opposed, say that again, were they opposed to? I, it, it went by very quickly, and I had the impression from what went by that the ACLU was against reversing the renun those who renounced their citizenship, but maybe I misunderstood because it went by very quickly. Um, that, that, that's a very complex but important question. There is no single ACLU <coughs> except the one in Washington, D.C. There are, you know, as you know, chapters in Los Angeles and San Francisco. The Northern California chapter is the one in which um, um, uh, Wayne Collins and and basic Ernest basic were were there and they're the ones that were asked by the people in um, in Tui Lake to come and look into the situation that is the people who are in the segregation camp people who were in prison in the stockade and so both of them went in and basic went in and told the uh, Raymond best the stockade is illegal you must close it down they agreed but then when when he when when uh, Bisig left the uh, uh, the next day the stockade and uh, still continued, and when Bisig left, uh, what happened was that his car broke down some few miles later on because they found out later, Bisig did at at the at the uh, at the um, garage that someone had put sugar in the um, gas tank, which then just froze the. Uh, uh, you know, froze the engine. Well, uh, the Northern California chapter asked uh, Washington, D.C. to uh, uh, help out with this illegal uh, Tui Lake camp area, the stockade. And the, North, and the National J uh, ACLU refused to do so because they were friends with the other politicians. I see. In Washington, D.C. Yeah. This is an area, please uh, look into it. There are materials on this, okay? I, and I just want to say that I didn't know anything about the citizen renunciations. Um, so I learned something there. And it reminded me not only that, that the camps seem to be a forerunner to Guantanamo, but in the election um, when Romney ran and spoke about um, Mexicans self-deporting and Latinos self-deporting, I thought, oh my God, here's a precursor to forced self-deportations in terms of this renunciation, et cetera. Yes. Yes. And the last thing I want to say is I really think I, I'm very interested in this idea of bringing this historical crime to an international tribunal, and I hope it proceeds because we have to get rid of this American exceptionalism and think about an international standard for all things. Yes. But, and I hope the documentary gets out. I also hope that someone, because we know that nowadays fiction films have much wider reach than. Well, I need, if you know a distributor, I still am, am in search of a distributor. I've actually, was this film too long for any of you? No. Because um, I've been asked to shorten it if I want to get it on PBS. I had to lose 18 minutes. Can you, I have to take out 18 minutes from this film. I tried and I, I, I was depressed for months. <laughs> I haven't succeeded, but I will go back in and, and attempt to take out 18 I minutes. I hope it's on PBS. And I hope also it inspires fiction writers to think about a, a kind of fiction no-no version, because that would be a way of reaching a whole other audience that may not want to Please, watch I mean, documentaries. Please, I invite everybody here to you know, read 
learn as much as you can. I mean, I started this five years ago, as I said, and I, when I, I was first, I first started this project because of my family. I, they would never, they would not, they were the part of the social amnesia. They didn't really want to talk about it or only talk about very superficial things. And then once I got deeper and deeper into the history, I said, oh my God. Um, you know, and I, when I came across the citizen isolation centers, I said, Jesus, what? What the? So that's why I've done this film, and and it took me three visits to the loop to the Navajo reservation to find those people who knew about those that prison. I mean, we drove for. My my son was he with me. He's he's a filmmaker and in his own right, and um, I was lucky to have him with me on that journey and. You know, it was like you, you go talk to Aunt so and so who knows so and so, and it's miles and miles apart. But we did, in, in fact, I showed the film at the at the Navajo uh, uh, at the community center there, and um, some kids were crying. You know, after as I went up to them, I said, well, "Are you okay?" He says, "I was Grandpa, who was speaking in the Dine language." And you know, it just it made me cry. But you know, he, it, they were wonderful people. It, it took ages to find them, but those the trading post people were they were the they were the people who previously owned the Loop trading post would not sell their anything to the Japanese prisoners. We're not going to sell to those. But the McGee family said, "What? What? They just come on." So they were in the Sunrise Trading Post, and then they eventually took over the Loop Trading Post. And that was, so the man who spoke and said the guy who gave him a haircut, he was a young boy. And he talked about, you know, he said, he told me, you know, yeah, he just wandered around. He said, first they had to have guards with them. And then, you know, they would sell them toiletries, cigarettes, whatever. And then um, he says, they were so trustworthy. They just left the stuff on the back of the truck, and people came up and made their own change. He said they were wonderful people, you know. He and um, they have been very supportive in this project. And um, you know, you sh there's nothing there now, although they want to keep. The, you know, the guy who was in the uh, uh, in the administrator's building, that building still exists. And we started digging a little bit, and there are stones still, still to be found in there. I tried to bring some back, but there's there's. You know, maybe there is a way to preserve that site, one portion of that site. There are 83 men who were taken there. And that box that you saw them in, I built that box. Because when I heard Air Harry Ueno say, the box was six by five by four foot high, I went, oh my god, five people were in that small space? So I only have three in there in the reenactment, but I wrote in that box. And believe me, it was extremely uncomfortable. Um, but, you know, read as much as you can. I mean, Tetsu's book, if you go to the website for abitterlegacy.com, you'll see links to how to get uh, Tetsudin's book about uh, judgment without trial, which is an invaluable resource. You can go to Chiz's website and order prints that you saw in the movie. And all the other historians are just a wealth of information. So please, you know, avail yourself of those resources. And any other question? Until you get into the university, then you hear more about it, the professors, because, you know, there's different, it's not just, I don't think so, Americanized, you know, so you get different uh, point of views and stuff. But um, just like the lady was saying in terms of like how also Mexican Americans were in the past sent back to Mexico and these were citizens and didn't even know the language or anything. And seeing this, it just, it's very frightening and it's so true what he said. You know, once you get that fear into people, it becomes us versus them. Yeah. And it's super scary right now because you're starting to see that again. We're talking about Muslim Americans, but we're talking also about Mexi Mex yes. Mexican Americans, born and raised here, third generation. And my son doesn't even speak Spanish. And to just say that, you know what, you can just be shipped off anywhere just because you look that way. Yeah. Yeah. I make it a point to have my son, you know, be aware of the history so he can know what is going on because the majority of people my age don't even know this existed or happened. So I try to teach him so he's aware and hopefully people would put it out there and know that this has happened before and it can happen again if we don't stand up and 
put it out there exactly. and do something about it. You're right. Thank you. I'd like to make a comment about the ACLU since you brought it up. I would like to make a comment about the ACLU, uh, especially the, the National Board. Uh, they refused to take a stand against Executive Order 9066 in 1942. And uh, actually, it's, it was uh, um, Peter Irons that uh, did some investigation and found in the minutes of the National Board that they did not want to embarrass FDR. And to this day, they have not apologized for that. Yes, I, I told the JCL I wouldn't, you know, I, I was going to tell the story, and I did invite Priscilla Huchita, who was president of the JCL at the time, and I told her I didn't expect her to defend. She she can't come right out and, and acknowledge all of that that part, but... Um, no, I'm talking about the ACLU. Oh, the ACLU, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I thought you meant the JCL. So ACLU. Yeah, well, Wayne, Wayne Collins, you know, was originally working for the ACLU, and then when he started doing the renunciation cases, he had to disassociate from the ACLU um, to, do, to really try, is what, he, what Wayne told me. Um, but, yes, it was because the national, who was the head of the, the ACLU at the time? Um, Baldwin, yes. Uh, you know, he really did want to curry favor with Roosevelt. So he said, well, it's, yeah, it's fine, it's fine. But thanks to you know, Ernest Bessig and, and the people of Northern California, they were willing to go take on those cases. They were searching. Nobody, the thing is, no, no, no other Japanese Americans would step forward to take, let him take on. He was looking for people to take on this case because he knew it was wrong. He knew it was unconstitutional. But Fred Korematsu said, yeah, I'll, I'll be there. You know, I'll stand up. And uh, I work with Karen Korematsu a lot today. She is out traveling the country, talking, you know, explaining the story, handing out material to all the schools. Any school that asks for it, um, she gives the material about this history. So please, you know, support the Korematsu Institute. I, my part of this film is going to be uh, in, input into a new DVD that they're sending out as part of this educational kit. So. You know, yes, I'd like to get the film out to a wider audience, but I, I just appreciate that all of you came today, to, and then hopefully you've, you know, everyone has learned a little something. Which leads us into a great, great segue. Um, Claudia, please let us know um, how we can get your DVD or when it will be available. Um, well, if there, I have a, a mailing list outside if you want to just sign, physically sign that mailing list, and I'll let you know when it becomes available. If you go to, there's a website, my website is abitterlegacy.com, uh, and there's a contact me, or to contact, you know, a page on there, and I will, anybody who's signed up, I will let you know when this become available. But I have to first to find a distributor before I can let any DVDs out. And as soon as they are available, I will let Janum, uh, uh, have as many copies, you know, they will have copies here for sale too. But just stay in touch and hopefully I find a distributor very soon. <laughs> well, I, I'm working with Tetsuden about the next project. So, okay, here's the hidden stories, you know, hidden camps, uh, little known stories. Uh, well, the next one is a little known stories about the. Um, mostly the Issei, who are, the, who are aliens who were taken away, and what happened to them. And that's, you know, that's, it, we have to, so we're going to differentiate between this uh, incarceration, this is more incarceration history. So this will, this will be the true internment story, people who were not citizens, and what happened to them, and the numerous, you know, prisons and camps that they were sent to, and what happened, and, you know, eventually from Crystal City, I mean, from all, all of them, and then, um, so Tuna that's Canyon, which next, is here in Tuna California. Canyon, all, all of those, you know, assembly centers, well, the assembly, the equivalent of an assembly center for the, anyway, I am learning and we're talking in discussion and so that's, I, that's hopefully my next film. I really appreciate Claudia doing all these things with uh, Tetsuo. Tetsuo. Yeah. And uh, I'm so happy that she made me a part of it. Um, if you're interested in my book, um, Camp Days, 1942 to 1945. Uh, you can just go to my website, Judy De Quiros, Judy Sugita, um, Chizuko, Judy Sugita. Oh, Chizart is the one way to yeah. do it. 
Art by Chiz. It's on the website. You can get her link on the website. Yeah. My website. But anyway, thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thanks so much.